GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your trusted source for relevant and legitimate Web3 information so you don't fall behind the internet revolution. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that Web3 is going to change the world. That's why I'm here to guide the world's top talent down the rabbit hole as you contribute and capitalize on the opportunity. On today's episode of the Doer Spotlight, we've got with us Zach Herwagen from Snag Solutions. Zach is the co-founder and CEO over at Snag, where they're focused on empowering some of the top digital creators by giving them control of the buying experience. More specifically, Snag builds NFT marketplaces for collection. So it's a white label NFT marketplace. They've built the NFT marketplace for Board Ape Yacht Club, for Goblin Town, for the Undead, Supernormal, and about 30 other projects. So they're really deep in the space, which is what brings such a great conversation today from Zach. Today we dive into why having your own NFT marketplace is important as a creator. What does it allow? What can you do with your own NFT marketplace? There's the obvious that you can have lower fees, that you can enforce creator royalties. We Zach and I go down a bit of a rabbit hole on creator royalties and where we're at now. And he's got some really interesting takes on where he thinks we're going to be a year from now in terms of creator royalty enforcement actually becoming more of a thing where right now Blur and OpenSea have just basically both said no creator royalties because they're just trying to grab market share. So Zach really opens up our eyes to what is happening behind the scenes. What are the devs working on that might be coming out in terms of protocols and standards in the next year that really will help creators enforce royalties. But also we talk about if you have your own NFT marketplace on your own website, what does that allow you to do? It allows you to get into a better user experience and potential around loyalty and rewards, which we break all of that down. So buckle up. This is an incredible episode with Zach from Snag Solutions, breaking down NFT marketplaces and building some of the top marketplaces for some of the top collections in the space. But before we jump into the show, Let's just take a minute to hear from our sponsor. The future of social media is here, and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators, and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we've partnered with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. Shared ownership is revolutionizing the way we think of digital ownership. Did you know that you can benefit from the utility of a Board Ape Yacht Club, CryptoPunk, or Azuki without actually spending tens of thousands of dollars to buy it? How? By buying an access key to the asset. You see, with Segment, you can now buy and hold parts of an expensive NFT and share in its ownership and utility, like airdrops or exclusive access. As an owner of a high-profile NFT, you can distribute ownership with access keys and create liquidity for yourself. It's a win win situation. Plus, the ownership and transfer of these keys are managed on chain, which ensures transparency and security. And we want the Web3 Academy community to be on the forefront of this new wave of NFT utility, which is why we partner with Segment, a non-custodial NFT platform set to launch in Q3 of this year. Segment aims to allow users to easily create access keys and share ownership of NFTs 
with other friends and community members. The team is going through their beta release soon and has opened up their waitlist for Web3 Academy listeners. If you want to stay in the forefront of Web3, sign up for Segment's waitlist today with the link in the show notes below. Shared ownership is a game changer and we want you to be there first. Welcome to the show, Zach. GM, Jay. Glad to be here. Really excited to chat today. If you guys are listening on the podcast, you don't know that Zach is wearing an ape hat and I'm wearing a Moonbirds hat and we both are with black shirts on. So we're in our full NFT community uniforms today. <laughs> Absolutely. Dressing for the neck up. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Not, neither of us are wearing pants. No pants. <laughs> on the podcast. So Zach, you just got back from East Denver. Have you had a chance to take a deep breath? I'm sure the craziness that that was. There are no deep breaths in Web3, as you know, especially being a, a founder in Web3, but using the energy to push forward. Great to see so many builders out there. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, so always like to start off by hearing your rabbit hole story, but more than your rabbit hole story, I want to go back to your schooling before and then to DoorDash and your experience being such an early employee at DoorDash and then how that sort of led you to Web3. Awesome. Yeah, I'll try to go cliff notes here, but wouldn't have called myself much of a student, but but when I was, my major was economics and then you know senior year really with an emphasis, a specialization on Austrian economics or kind of libertarian economics and setting up you know more decentralized governance systems, both within politics, company governance, et cetera. And so definitely caught that hill almost philosophically a little bit and put all of my money, maybe $600 into one Bitcoin for the tail end of college, but then was focused on getting into kind of tech and startups and never caught the Ethereum bug and, and really understood the smart contracting opportunity. And so ended up at DoorDash early out of school as an early launch team member, traveling full time and starting our new markets back when we were launching in places like Nashville and Miami. And, you know, wound up through having that early opportunity and chance to learn the business, moving up into a set of kind of leadership roles, leading new business units like our pickup product, our ads platform. And then finally, our white label restaurant business helping run fulfillment for large merchants like Papa John's, Panera, et cetera, who wanted to run delivery through their own app and website and really control the experience. Obviously, it's that last experience that kind of ties into what we're building at Snag Solution, but also had the chance to meet my co-founder Jason along the way as our merchant engineering lead on a lot of that product offering, ads platform, carousel real estate, point of sale integrations, et cetera. So having that firsthand experience to meet amazing technologists like Jason, who I've been able to kind of pull off on the back end, but then also learn from amazing business leaders, even though I feel like I sometimes missed five years of run up in crypto, I also gained six years of awesome kind of like traditional business leadership experience that mm. applies quite well in Web3. So tell me, did you and Jason start Snag while you were still at DoorDash? Did you take the leap and just go out on your own one day and give your resignation? How did that go? I wrote what I would kind of call a research paper, right? A two pager on this opportunity. I think I called it opportunities and NFT infrastructure. And I sent it to Jason and actually one other engineer who did not make the jump with us. And we worked on it as kind of a weekly 45 minutes scoping inside project for a couple of months. At some point had to kind of, you know, start to figure out what would need to be true here for us to take off and go commit to this. And then decided to chat with a couple of customers and it was Really, when we chatted with, it was Crypto Checks and Pirates of the Metaverse were our first two sales combos and both, you know, fairly immediately agreed to use the product that we felt like we had some level of traction, right? It was almost a little bit of a false positive at first and we had to work pretty hard to get the next five right. yeses <laughs> after that. Uh, it wasn't quite that easy, but gave us some confidence, Jason and I at least, to jump off and go full time on this. And I love that you pitched, and this is what I always say to any entrepreneur, any founder out there, sell the product before you even have the product. Because if you go build something and you're not building it for somebody, then you're building it for nobody and you never know what the consumer actually wants. So go get a sale and tell them that you have it and then go build it. Like fake it a little bit in the beginning and then you go make it. Absolutely. Yeah. One of my best friends who actually helped pull me into Web3 initially, he gave me a real speech. He had some entrepreneurial experience prior and he said, hey man, you have to be selling vaporware here. 
right? I was right. Yeah, these totally. biz, business emails on let's let's have the scoping conversation. He's like, mm-hmm. no, you have to say we have this product. Do you want it? Mm-hmm. Which like I think some people would say that's you know that's deceiving or manipulative, but that's more just like manifestation in my mind. Like it's the belief. It's not that you're not going to do it. It's not that you're not capable of doing it. You are. People don't buy things. People don't sign up for things unless they believe in them. So you got to manifest it a bit in that way. I'm curious the paper that you wrote, this two pager. Can you give us the Cole's notes on? On that or what the highlights were from that? Yeah. So I really described two opportunities and I think it ties to where we are today, but also where we want to go to some degree as a business. Opportunity one, again, was leading this white label tooling part of the business, how we build new white label services for restaurants. And one was let's do that for, for NFT projects. And that was all pre, you know, no royalties, which we can chat about a bit later. So the real value prop was as I was flipping a Ape NFT back a year or so ago, paid three thousand or more dollars to OpenSea on a transaction, mm-hmm. and I felt like, hey, that that is not the right relative value, here, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of that is actually what has led to that feeling of loss and fairness is what has led to this whole zero royalty mm-hmm. movement. But out ahead of that, I kind of felt like there's a better creator-owned model on the marketplace experience, especially so yeah, it's so easy to aggregate liquidity in this space. Um, and kind of offer that best selection really around a fee reduction value prop to start. So that was idea number one. Idea number two, which is still a place I would love to go with this, was around ticket. And could we pretty much do a, you know, ticket master plus stub hub all in one that lets IRL creators use NFTs as the fundamental ticketing technology to capture secondary sales. As we chatted with folks like Kenny Gersh was actually super helpful. He had a quick combo as kind of a friend. He's in the ape community and the VP of uh, biz dev at the MLB. He was like, yes, we want to do this, but no, we're not really ready to like jump into using you know, Web3 technology today to do this, right? right? Versus very well could be something they look at five years from now. And so we really decided that we wanted to start with this white label tooling to build this fairly robust, customizable solution that we could deploy for various use cases in the future. For sure. I've been saying for over a year that somebody needs to do NFT marketplace white labeling and you're, you nailed it. And there's a few others that are doing it. So let's jump into the story of you guys building the marketplace for Ape DAO and ApeCoin. And how did that happen? I remember when I saw the story break, and this is when I first heard about you, the headline was something like small startup beats out Magic Eden and Rarible to build the Board Ape Yacht Club marketplace. How did this go down? Tell us how you guys won that deal. First off, as I already referenced, I'm part of the Board Ape community, which is pretty relevant here and have been. They were one of the first NFTs I purchased when I was like, yes, I want to be in this space back a year and a half ago. And so always would have dreamed of working with that you know, mm-hmm. project organization, et cetera. And really one of our advisors, Tropo Farmer, who's mm-hmm. one of the better followed folks on Twitter, probably crypto Twitter period. Really, it was his idea that this would be an awesome way for us to put ourselves out there and an awesome way to show how quickly we can customize a experience to work well for this community. And because our product at the core is truly white label, there's not that much custom work. Hopefully that's not a dirty secret that has gone into this marketplace. Some of the metadata customization is fairly custom, but the the Mm core platform itself is one one hour setup or less. So we thought of it as really a a proof of concept, but Magic, even then, as we were drafting the proposal, kind of sniped us and and beat us to the first post. And so went and kind of ripped what we had Mm -hmm. and got it cleaned up over the course of three hours from there. I I had it all drafted or I couldn't have moved that quickly. And, you know, entered the fray along with at least a couple of others who were trying to use the platform as a similar proof of concept. And the thing I would really remark on from there in terms of what led to the success in that process is one upstream of any of the tactical things we did, just deep engagement with the community. Already being a community member helps, but really like going into the Discord, there's a core Discord where a lot of the core ApeCoin contributors hang out and really going engaging with them listening to feedback, incorporating that into the draft. And then the second thing is kind of looking deeply at and thinking critically about what does Magic Eden have to offer? And and I have a lot of respect for Magic Eden as a Web3 startup, a ton of respect. They are really well run and better resourced than we were by a mile, right? <laughs> and, and so I had to kind of ask, you know, what can be unique about our platform 
versus others. And when I really looked at the Magic Eden tech stack, this is on the less positive side. I found it was very centralized. They didn't enable aggregation. They kind of double signing requirements to stop that. Also, all their listings are, are in a centralized database. That's true of Open yeah. and others as well. That's not unique, right? But anyway, it was really inhibited our tech stack because we were so early in our build mm -hmm. to move on to Reservoir, which is an open data layer storing signatures on Arweave versus a centralized database, utilizing their aggregation APIs, which help enable distribution of liquidity and our operability, mm -hmm. and then really committed to the community that those were the values we wanted to play by, as well as non-extraction, where we then went to, I don't know, maybe like 25% of what Magic Eden was asking for in terms of a marketplace fee. I think they mm -hmm. were looking at 1% and we came back at a quarter percent, if I'm remembering correctly. And so really lo looking at, you know, less of the product itself, because Magic Eden has a great product, and more of how we build a business that deeply aligns with creators and their communities. And when we, you know, fast forward to, to the marketplace wars things, when we think about the triangle of creators, traders, and collectors, for us, it's always been obvious we're here with the creators and the collectors. And so it's actually... Mm -hmm quite simplifying in terms of not needing to lead into the zero royalty thing as others have, et cetera, and kind of right. you know, focus there. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is you won the bid partly because you were an ape holder yourself. So you're in the community. Was, was anybody from the Magic Eden side or the Rarible side or any of them ape holders? I actually think when a company gets that big, it's not even that relevant at that point. But were the CEOs, I don't know. It wasn't really part of the narrative, nor would it right. been that authentic at, at that point. Right, right. Okay, so you were part of the community, but you were also agile and able to respond to what the community wanted, whereas obviously Magic Eden was saying, this is what we do and this is how we do it. Here you go. So was the call from ApeCoin DAO, and it was ApeCoin DAO that put this out, right? Am I correct in saying so, that? Yeah, we put the proposal into the ApeCoin community along with Magic Eden, Rarible, X Marketplace, and some others. Who made the first move? Was it somebody so, on... So Magic Eden put in their proposal. Oh, on their own. They just said, on hey, you guys should have your own market marketplace. And, and we had already planned to do the same thing. So I had a Google... No plan. way. And I sent him the Google Doc that day because I was like, you know, if Magic Eden's going, it's go time, right? Holy um, genius. Wow. So just and, happening at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And, and what was actually interesting in the process is it was a, each vote was a yes, no vote, right? And so because three of them initially went up to vote at the same time, this is a little bit semantic, but the DAO side of it is actually pretty interesting as well. Yeah. So three of them went through at the same time and they were all kind of to be unofficial marketplace of ApeCoin DAO. Right. And the, the implication there being that if multiple had one, then there could be multiple links from, from the ApeCoin website would kind of be the way to think about it. Yeah. And so not only did we win by a pretty wide margin, 85 plus percent, but none of our competitors won and none of our competitors have passed since in the several votes that, that have happened since that. I can't say that that's forever or that that's an explicit goal, but we're definitely trying to continue to deliver a high quality experience in a way that doesn't cause the community to think it's intelligent to just splinter kind of consumer demand and pushing folks in one direction. Yeah, I wouldn't think that would make any sense to have multiple marketplaces. That would just be confusing to the user. I'd start to feel like I wouldn't trust either of them because I'd be like, which one's real? Am I getting scammed? Wow, fascinating. So just to go back to the DAO side for a second, because this is so interesting. Can anybody come in and make a proposal? So you don't have to be a holder to make a proposal. You have to be an ApeCoin holder, but okay. ApeCoin, you know, is anybody can buy a purchasable Super requirement. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, you have to have a certain number of ApeCoin. I think one ApeCoin is the main one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what can you buy on this marketplace? Which of the yeah. NFTs tokens can you buy there? Right now, it's anything created by Yuga. So oh, really, not so not things that have been acquired by. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay. So it's not CryptoPunks. It's not MeBits. Yes. And also not 10KTF. Honestly, as we have this conversation, I kind of think we should expand that. What One of the reasons to not include them initially was one, to start small and kind of nail the experience. But two, because 
they have a 0% marketplace already. And so given we were starting at a quarter percent, it just didn't make a ton of sense to me, to be honest. But now that we actually went back and we've waived all fees for all of our creators as creator relief in, in wake of the opens the announcement. So maybe time to go back and, and layer some of those in. Interesting. I've just got to ask that then. If you have no fees, how do you make revenue? We normally have fees. They're waived through uh, end of June as of right now. Okay. I definitely could consider extending that very much on the table, but at some point, we will need to make money. So it's a temporary uh, thing. It's yes. a temporary thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So similar to what OpenSea did when I think they only waived them for like 48 hours or something like that. Yeah. But I think it's actually the exact opposite of that. OpenSea reduced royalties and removed the user fee to try to drive traffic, right? We have never had a user fee, but have now also eliminated our creator fee to go to truly no revenue in order to support creators when they need it most. Fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about why Board of Yacht Club or any other collection would want their own marketplace. What was the reason that you thought that this was such a good idea? And you mentioned a few of them before when you talked about your paper, but just take us down that path. And then we'll have to come back to the reason today, which is royalties, right? Right. Which, yeah, yeah. Not, which was not the case in this headspace back six months ago. So I can answer your question first. I would say it's reducing fees for users, right? And the marketplace fee itself, right? And taking that to zero. Because the truth is, even back then, that folks were using OTC services like an NFT trader at the time, mm -hmm. right? In large part, because you know, the way I would always explain it is I'm fine with the royalty, but I'm not fine with the 2.5% right thousand dollar open cv right and so you're giving users back to the kind of tipping analogy here social reason to work around your royalty that was my framing of the problem prior to everything that's happened since the second one that's even more relevant the bigger the brand is is to keep consumers on your own platform it's so all i'll talk through the context of adidas for a second who would be a, definitely a dream customer for us because right now they take folks from their Adidas Twitter page and they either push them directly to OpenSea or they push them to their website, which then pushes them to OpenSea to purchase, mm -hmm. right? I'd imagine to some degree when I go on the Adidas site, it's like Adidas times Gucci, right? They're, they're trying to get us DGENs moved over into their other luxury mm -hmm. products and they're not really solving that as effectively as they can be from a mm -hmm. consumer experience perspective. And that's before you get it to kind of more of a generalized version of that problem, which is the ability to capture CRM information, add in programs like loyalty, customize the experience in a way that that really improves conversion and pulls people back, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So so we have a lot of roadmap on kind of social and royalty is or mm -hmm. sorry, not royalty, loyalty. Uh, they rhyme. Maybe, maybe maybe we can get Snoop Dogg to do a rhyme on that. He's he's all in Web three. He's absolutely been smoking Web three recently. So I think he could come up with something. Yeah, he's a creator, so he, he could say like, "Hey, where's the loyalty?" You know, you know yeah, yeah. My, my <laughs> Snoop, if you're listening to this, man, we want to hear it. <laughs> okay, so I love that because buying an NFT isn't like buying toilet paper where I can go to Amazon to buy it, right? Buying an NFT, and especially in the future when NFTs have the tech is used to its fullest potential, when there's a membership pass involved or there's access involved through token gaining or there's some sort of perks involved, doing that all on a generalized marketplace, you're losing out on your full customer experience. You can't explain it nearly as well. Marketplaces work well for traders, right? So the thing I'm curious about is, are you seeing the volume though? Are people transacting on these marketplaces? And I know that in context, most trading right now is done by wash trading and just flipping back and forth Yeah, oh, for the blur, the next That's blur airdrop, but... It's tough. Yeah. It, I don't think we've seen our product in a fair environment or we did two weeks post launch when our product wasn't very good. And because we enforce royalties on every transaction, by the way, even if it's an aggregated listing that there's a royalty enforced on the buy side back to the thesis of, you know, being mm -hmm. the platform for creators, full royalty payments at large or something in the like 10 to 15% category in this space. Right. 10 to 15 percent. Right. Right now, on average, when I look at that's collection specific, but I look at this stuff yeah. a lot as I'm formulating sales materials, et cetera. Our top communities 
are doing five to 10% of total volume through our marketplace, all of which enforce royalties, right? Is that meaningful in the grand scheme of things? I wish it was a lot higher, but is it meaningful in terms of royalty enforced transactions right now? Absolutely. For sure. Five to 10% is pretty good when, especially right now in the current market, there's not a lot of new people coming into the space. New people coming into the space might go to Board API Club's website or might go to Goblin Town's website, and then they end up on their marketplace and they're purchasing through that way. But traders aren't doing that. So let's talk about royalties a little bit. Just curious to get your thoughts on how this all played out and how you think about it moving forward in the future. Absolutely. Loaded question, but I'll get going and then you, you can chime in. I think personally that royalties are the primary innovation of NFTs as a technology platform right now. And if I tie it back to what I talked about a bit ago on ticketing, that's why someday I think we'll be able to sell the MBA on using NFTs as a tech platform. It really works well for the use case. But that sale will only be possible when we're able to sufficiently restrict, you know, non-royalty platforms, i.e., you know, in this analogy, SeatGeek, StubHub, et cetera, from picking up in the listings in a way that actually just ends up mirroring the current system. With that in mind, and then kind of a second thought here, hot take, this time next year, 80% of all NFT volume will be coming from smart contracts that are not yet written today. Right. So if you pair those in conjunction, then the creators are actually going to be able to take control of this situation. And it's never going to be perfect, by the way, but but we're talking about entirely new protocols and token standards that really do a better job of enforcing royalties and tracking royalties at the smart contract layer. And so as we get those solutions in place in, you know, just the next few weeks or a month here. I mean, there, there are lots of other folks sprinting on this as well. And, and we're working with, you know, I would shout out Reservoir in particular, who I mentioned as an awesome technology partner earlier. But we now need to act less as a white label marketplace and more as a royalty enforcement platform for, for mm. creators. And that white label marketplace is a core tool or even the core tool because it gives the creators a royalty enforced high quality buy sell experience to send their four collectors. Um, and none of the rest of this works without that. I think that's really what we're building for. And I've worked at least 50% more per week since the OpenSea announcement on a, a reasonably high base because I am so energized by the opportunity that this is presented for us due to candidly what I view as a big strategic misstep by OpenSea. And along with that, I'll actually say part of me wants to villainize Blur. But when I've heard their founder Pac-Man talk, I can't help but think that he seems like he was genuinely building for this trading use case that that is long gone unaddressed. And I kind of do think that the royalty enforcers can play with Blur, where Blur acts as more of a, a almost derivatives platform, right? Like in the scenario I'm describing, they could still wrap the tokens and trade them, right? Like we don't need to eliminate trading. We just need to more appropriately reward folks who pay and enforce royalties. There's so much to unpack in that. First of all, I, I completely agree that I think OpenSea made a misstep. I quite frankly don't understand why they did this. I mean, I actually do understand why. They were losing marketplace way too fast and they felt like they had no choice. They really stepped outside of what they said their core values and what they said their mission was. I had heard the founders talk about it. I read about it. And so, yeah, I thought that was bizarre. But let me go back to your hot take that one year from now, 80% of trades will be on new smart contracts. Where's that coming from? Is that because you see these smart contracts being worked at, at the protocol level or at the Ethereum foundation or yeah. where are you getting that from? All I have real insight into is what we're working on personally, because anyone working on as much as we are is going to have some level of secrecy right now. We're sharing with, with all the right partners, of course, please reach out if, if you'd like to learn more and are listening to this, but you know, <laughs> with the proper NDAs, et cetera. So anyways, what I can say is that on the creator side, which is what's driving all of this work and innovation, they want to enforce royalties. And even though there's some who could say, hey, well, well, royalties and gross dollars are up, the smarter and bigger creators recognize that one, that is driven by wash trade sales that are going to go away at some point in time, right? And that two, there's actually nothing stopping 
either blur or open sea from that matter from from taking a next notch down from 0.5 to zero right like what mm -hmm. and if one of them does it they've both shown they'll both they fall something yeah right. so, so, so the creators are actually you know at this moment in time have no control and with that in mind most creators not art blocks they've come out and talked about you know the provenance associated with the tokens which makes complete sense not crypto punks but most creators are very comfortable with you know wrapping the token migrating contracts moving to a standard that works better for what i'm describing here and do you think that because you mentioned there will always be a way around it so i think the big question here is is it really ever going to be enforceable on chain or will it just it's, be you know one dev moves and does a new protocol or new standard and then another dev moves and figures out a way to get around it it's never truly enforceable we're going pretty deep here but the kind of two ways that i would think about that one is that the wrapping is the easiest way to think about this even though there's other tactics and mechanics here where the same way that we can wrap any collection, you, you have Moonbirds on, so Moonbirds and move them over onto a new smart contract that enforces royalties in kind of the core call functions, then Blur can still wrap that thing and, and move it back onto their platform for, to trade with that royalty, right? right. You can always wrap the wrapper, right? But with that in mind, that the next layer here is actually to add, coming back to loyalty, but kind of abstracting that concept, is to figure out how we help creators provide rewards or incentives to the collector audience in particular versus the trader audience that are more meaningful than foregoing royalty itself, right? And the simple version would be whatever the next Moonbirds mint is to stick on that. They could reference this, this on-chain royalty record in the mint function. And if the royalty wasn't paid on the most recent transaction, withhold that mint. Right. Well, and so what I'm describing there is you can abstract that into a point system, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can, you know, create ways to block things that have interacted with blur contracts or ways to let people pay to let things back into the system, right? You can create a whole system here that is on paper in mine and others' heads right now, but it definitely can exist and, and it will never completely solve the problem, but it will hopefully shift the majority of volume or at least ha right, like the open c plus blur duopoly world was not that bad right? <laughs> it'll it'll at least bring that back is kind of the way i would think about it where there is a platform for creators and their communities mm -hmm. as a primary trading platform so that's where our headspace is the last yeah time. the loyalty it's so funny that we keep saying royalty and loyalty but the loyalty side of it that makes a ton of sense to me because as you said from the beginning, if you have your own marketplace, then there's much more you can do to improve the user experience for your collectors. And let's be real here. If you can have them transacting in your own marketplace, then you can have a loyalty program and there's all the different things you can do for that. I like your example of you can't mint the next thing. That's real pain right there. I was thinking more something like you get you get perks or points or something like that, but then he's here to play the ball. He's, he's, he's not messing around. Not my decision. I'm creating both options for the creator right. to enforce this the way they see fit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's talk about some other projects that you've worked on. What other collections have you worked with and what have you seen go well? What have you learned from those? I'll talk about maybe two or three here today. Just We have for context, definitely 40 plus active partners at this point, activating something like 10 a month. But let's talk about Goblin Town, Genuine Undead, and The Plate mm. today. Those have been three awesome partners amongst many other awesome partners. Goblin Town was a really big deal for us early, and the marketplace has not gone that well at the same time. And both can, can mm. be true, and we will come back and solve the marketplace problem with them. They're an engaged partner. We're going to take a few cracks at this until we get it right. But one, they were the first big creator to get excited to work with us, even out ahead of us having a product that was ready for a creator at their scale. Uh, and this is Goblin Town and Truth Labs, the, the whole ecosystem. But their co-founder, Alex, who's a entrepreneur of a, a DAO tooling startup upstream, he's actually just like a really 
smart business person, intuitively saw the value in having his own channel that helped reinforce this world that they're building, that this digital world, right? And so I'm trying to not use metaverse for that because I don't know if that's quite right. Anyways, he saw the value and he helped really define our roadmap early. I think the customization of that experience is excellent. We've recently embedded features like creator announcements that let them cryptographically sign to more securely communicate with their community. Uh, which has been a, a problem for them amongst many others in the past, right? So they've really driven a lot of our early roadmap. But the one decision that has not yet panned out is that they decided not to aggregate listings from other platforms. And because of that, we've definitely had a bit of a cold start problem on driving kind of that, that consumer side flywheel due to the amount of liquidity that we've been able to get on there at any point in time. Learning is that the, the aggregation tactic is critical to this first party experience and lots of other great learnings that will hopefully help us, you know, kind of crack this one in terms of how we drive a real flywheel there. The second one I'll talk about, you know, I'm actually going to skip Genuine Undead for right now. And I'm going, sorry, Gen, GU, I uh, love you all. But uh, I'm going to chat about Super Normal because I think there's a more interesting learning there, which is they're uh, one of the probably the top project in, in Korea, a huge following out there and very tied into the kind of Korean Hollywood is definitely not the right term, but that, that's what's coming out right now. Anyways, the core thing they asked for, which has been really helpful to play around with and learn about as a user, is they wanted us to help market make their collection so that we could perpetuate liquidity that was unique back onto the marketplace while helping them kind of fix the blur versus at the time open sea floor price dynamic where blur was always running at their royalties 8%. So blur always runs exactly 8% lower, right? Like traders are smart. And so we're talking with a market making firm now about how we scale this mechanic. But what we effectively found is that if they give the ability for one maker or one set of creator aligned market makers to take listings and on offers off of your royalty platforms and redistribute them onto royalty enforced platforms at or just below the royalty enforced floor, that there is demand for right like as you can create unique liquidity there is demand for that royalty enforced experience i've been doing this on my own just to kind of like learn the process and, and help us solve some of the mechanics here but i've one learned a lot about the third platform a lot about market making but two learned that doubling down on unique native liquidity does drive demand the listings get purchased right if you can drive the best liquidity they will come it's kind of for sure yeah. And then the last one I mentioned is the plague, and that, that's been an exciting one. They launched just about a week ago. Two things they did. One, they launched a whole new digital experience that we were well linked from and featured in, which is a huge piece of the growth flywheel, just being linked into the website and Twitter well. The difference, I'd say like 25% of our creators are in that 5 to 10% purchasing range, mm -hmm. and they're the 10% that have us really well linked into their website. Right. It's really just for I sure. I had something better right now, but that's the first thing. And so they launched with that, but they also launched with FRG token enabled, which is their ERC. Token. Okay. And what's been really interesting is because there's le like ApeCoin is a currency to some degree already, even though the other side has not launched yet. It's already thought of that way. It's traded on Uniswap that way. It's financialized in that way. FRG is somewhat pre financialization. But it still has real value to community members who believe in the plate community. They're really building cool stuff. Ponds is awesome. Is one of my favorite Twitter follows. Really big on building decentralization via you know an NFT community. And so because of that ability to kind of capture that energy from the community around use of token for purchasing, it's mm -hmm. helped to drive a recurring traffic flywheel. And we're we're seeing pretty solid usage of both FRG postings, but also just purchasing OpenSea and other listings while they're there shopping on the platform. So that's been really great to see the last week or two. You confident at the beginning of you never get a deep breath in Web3 is so true. You're just, the amount that you must have to wake up every day and be like, oh God, what happened while I was sleeping? Because <laughs> like, you're a small team. I guess that's probably one of the key reasons that you're able to be so agile and to respond and to pivot as a founder and as an entrepreneur. How do you think about that? And you know, what advice would you have to fellow founders out there? Yeah, great questions. The thing that's really worked for me personally is to carve out space for what I'm excellent at and hire great team members to manage everything else, even early, right? 
even though if I think about our core team today, it's four or five folks, including myself. So super mm -hmm. small. I have an amazing intern who has mm -hmm. gone to full time, who I consider one of those four to five core team members who helps me scale business development outreach, mm -hmm. which you just can't scale when you get busy on everything mm -hmm. else, right? I, we don't need a sales department, but I do need help mm -hmm. following up with people. He also manages a lot of kind of, you know, account management activations, just like keep, mm -hmm. keep the thing running and he's hungry and hiring for hunger really obviously matters. And then I, everyone else on the team is an engineer. So, you know, the two things I love to do are, are strategic business development and then build custom product based on strategic business development to drive product roadmap. And so I've been able to even at, at small team scale hire in a way that lets me do kind of my dream job, right? Mm. Dirt, right? Nice. And those were kind of the things I did at DoorDash, but I had to deal with everything else too, right? Because you're just part of this big organization, mm -hmm. tons of people management too, that, that all, <laughs> well, <laughs> but you have to get back to exhausting in a little bit, but it, it is exhausting. Right. And then, so at this scale to be able to kind of drive roadmap and do that based on what the best partners, the, the best creators out there are asking for. And it's a lot of fun. And you, you talked about, Hey, like waking up and seeing what's going on. The interesting thing is that at our current scale, the data isn't yet that helpful. So it's really like, I look at my e inbox as like, who do I need to respond to? I'm our head of support. I'm our head of account management and <laughs> it's like head of sales. What nail do I have today that's going to pull us in a new direction? And how much time do you guys spend looking at the future with the engineers in terms of what they're building? Are you developing a long roadmap or are you more just going you know, month to month because things are changing so fast. At least start thinking three months out in roadmap. Mm -hmm. I like planning quarterly. I don't think we've yet like nailed the every three months is quarterly. It's more just a running three months yeah. out at this point, but, but we'll add some structure in the future. I'd say plan, but then plan to pivot, right? Mm -hmm. Post open C announcement, we accelerated a bunch of work on this kind of like royalty enforcement concept, building visualization of royalty enforcement into the core UI. And then we also already was core on our roadmap, but we also accelerated some of our core social build so that as we take a bigger bet on top creator experience, that we have a unique value prop to customers to hopefully keep them coming back. So, you know, planning five things and choosing two to focus on it. I again, <laughs> classic founders dilemma. All right. Before we wrap up, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of fun speed round questions coming at you. But before that, I just want to give you a chance to let our listeners know where they can find you online, where they can find Snag Solutions and anything that you want to tell them about, or this is the floor is yours to show. Creators are already thinking about, about the problem around incentivization, et cetera. So if, if you're uh, the same way you farm an airdrop, the same thing could apply to starting to think about honoring some of those creator royalties. Obviously that doesn't apply to all communities, but that, that could be like some light alpha from the show. And beyond that, you can find Snag Solutions on Twitter, Snag underscore solutions, online stagsolutions.io. And my biggest message would be that we are capitalized to be here for a couple of years. That's how we're subsidizing zero fees for creators for mm -hmm. the next several months. And we're here to do exactly that, help creators enforce royalties, as I've said, you know, a couple of times today. So I would love to chat about how we can help in, in a variety of ways. We, we build around custom requirements. So always looking to chat and learn from folks in the space. Awesome. I love it. Okay. Quick speed round, couple questions coming at you. First question, what's an NFT you'll never sell? My crypto punk. Mm -hmm. Which one do you have? Oh God. Name, name dyslexic here. Seven, yeah. 7181. 7181. Cool. Awesome. Something you bought recently for under a hundred dollars that brings you joy. Hmm. Doesn't have to be Web3. Yeah, it could be something else. I'm just trying to think because I live in San Francisco and everything's over a hundred dollars here. <laughs> uh, there's an in and out a half mile for me. That brings me joy. So I'll go with that. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's good. We don't have it in and out in Canada, so I'm jealous. Someday soon. I hope so. I hope so. I don't know. I don't know why not. Okay, last question. If you had a billboard that one billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? <laughs> Super off topic, but support Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any thesis that scales to a billion users for web three right now are, are <laughs> not that many people are paying attention to us quite yet. So let's use the ad real estate. Well, 
<laughs> well said. Well said. A true humanitarian. Zach, this has been a pleasure. Thanks so much for the time. Yeah, I really appreciate having you on the show. Great, great speaking today, Jay. Thanks so much for listening in, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. If it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.